Hi there. In this video, we're going to talk about how we generalize the Goldfeld quant test to test for more general forms of heteroscedasticity. And this is what we refer to in econometrics as a sort of Broich Pagan test. So, what do we mean by more general forms of heteroscedasticity? Well, the idea is that if we have some sort of population process, y is equal to alpha plus beta 1 x1 all the way through to beta p times xp plus some sort of population error u. Then if we had homoscedastic population errors, then the variance of u given all of my independent variables or a vector of them, x, um, then that should be just equal to some sort of constant sigma squared if we had homoscedastic errors. Contrast this with the situation if we had heteroscedastic errors. Well, in this context, then we would have the variance of u given a vector of my variables x would be equal to sigma squared times some sort of function of my independent variables. Right, and we, we might think that one particular function of my independent variables might be um, actually, let's say, alpha naught plus alpha 1 x1 um, plus alpha 2 times x2, yeah, all the way through to sort of alpha p times xp. And this is very general. Any of these particular alphas might be equal to zero. It might just be only that there's sort of heteroscedasticity along a few of these variables or perhaps one of these variables. But if there is heteroscedasticity along even one of these variables, or if the, any of these alpha alphas are different from zero other than the sort of alpha naught, then that is a sign that we've got heteroscedasticity and our OLS estimators are no longer blue. In particular, they're no longer best. There are other linear unbiased estimators which are more efficient than OLS. And also I should mention that under the case where we, we have heteroscedasticity, then it turns out that the standard errors which statistical software programs report are actually wrong, they're biased. So we would actually need to correct for that. So that's why it's so important to test for heteroscedasticity. Okay, so what do we, how do we test for this sort of more general form of heteroscedasticity? Well, remember what we did in the case of the Goldfeld quant test, we didn't, we don't actually observe this population error u, but what we did is we said, well, perhaps what we can do is we can look at our residuals, right? So our estimated values of u, which is just what we get out from our running our regression on our sample, right? And then if we square that and we look at the variance of our errors or estimated errors along one variable x, then perhaps we might have something which looks like this, right? So here we have the case whereby our variance of our residuals is decreasing as my xk increases, right? And that was just a sort of um, bivariate case where I just had heteroscedasticity being caused by one particular variable. But in the sort of more general form, I could have heteroscedasticity being caused by any number of variables. So sort of replace this k by sort of some other um, subscript j, and I might also observe I have this sort of heteroscedasticity. Or it might be that there's a linear combination of these two variables, and, and I've got heteroscedasticity along that. Any of these particular cases is evidence of heteroscedasticity. So how might we test for the presence of heteroscedasticity when we are sort of testing for this sort of more general form? Well, the idea is that because we don't observe our population errors, what we do is we take our estimated errors, our residuals, we, which we obtain from the original regression at the top here, and then we just regress them on a whole host of our independent variables, right? So x1, uh, u hat squared is equal to delta naught plus delta 1 times x1 plus delta 2 times x2, all the way through to, let's say, delta p times xp. And the idea is that if any of these coefficients on the x terms are different from zero or statistically different from zero, then essentially we have got at least heteroscedasticity in our sample. But it turns out that it's actually okay to, this is actually a good test for heteroscedasticity in our population if we specified our model correctly. So in, in a sense, we are testing for heteroscedasticity in the population by doing this. So if, what we could do is we could do a t-test on any of these coefficients, right? If we were just interested in heteroscedasticity along one of these variables. 
But in general, we don't really care what's causing heteroscedasticity, although it might be indicative or it might be informative to tell us what we might need to include in our model to remove the heteroscedasticity. In general, if we have any heteroscedasticity, then we have to rethink things, right? So if our sort of null hypothesis is that we have homoscedastic errors, which is that in this sort of auxiliary regression, we would have delta one is equal to delta two, which is equal to, let's say, delta p, which is all equal identically to zero. So that would be the case whereby I had homoscedastic errors because my residuals or my errors weren't dependent on my x terms. So when we're testing a sort of multiple um, hypothesis in terms of multiple coefficients, we generally use an f-test, right? So we could form an f-statistic. And because the restricted form is essentially, I'm restricting each of these coefficients after the delta naught to be equal to zero, then we use the form of the f statistic, which we normally get sort of outputted in, in Stata or eViews, except now we're doing the using the f statistic, which we get on our auxiliary regression. So the idea here is that our f is equal to the r squared of our auxiliary regression, divided by the number of variables, which is p, all divided by 1 minus r squared. And we need to standardize the bottom, so we divide that through by the number of degrees of freedom in this uh, particular estimation, which is n minus p minus 1. And it turns out that under the null hypothesis of homoscedastic errors, then this, um, well, our sort of, this statistic should have a sampling distribution, which is an f distribution with p degrees of freedom for the um, first input and n minus p minus 1 degrees of freedom for the second input. Okay, so what we could do is we could look up our critical value for an F distribution with these given degrees of freedom. And if our F statistic is greater than that value, then we would reject the null hypothesis that we had homoscedasticity. It wouldn't tell us what, what was causing that the heteroscedasticity, rather. It would just tell us that for one, one of these particular variables, I would have sort of delta I doesn't equal zero, right? So that's the sort of cost of this particular test. It doesn't tell you what's causing the um, heteroscedasticity. Um, of course, normally when you do a Broch-Pagan test, you kind of get the readout on this auxiliary regression. So you can sort of look through and look for high t-stats. So that might be a way of seeing what might be causing it. But if you just sort of read off the f uh, value or the sort of p-value associated with that f, it doesn't tell you what's causing that um, particular form of heteroscedasticity. It just tells you that there is some. Okay, so that's one way in which the Broich-Pagan test is conducted. The other way is to form something which we call the LM statistic. And the idea here is that you take the number of points in your sample and you times that by the R squared of this auxiliary regression for U hat squared. And it turns out that under the null hypothesis here, then whereby we have homoscedastic errors, then this is something which we call a chi-squared distribution with p degrees of freedom. And the idea, the sort of intuition behind this test is, well, if the R squared for my particular um, auxiliary regression is pretty high, then that's saying that I can explain my variations in my residuals by my independent variables. So that's probably a sign that I have heteroscedasticity, right? So the idea is that if I have a value of sort of n times R squared, which is particularly high, then because of the particular shape of the chi-square distribution, I will actually reject the null hypothesis. Normally, I think in statistical programs, it's this form of the um, Broch-Pagan test which is implemented, although I think in some statistical programs, both are um, quoted, but they are basically two variations on the same thing. They're not absolutely identical, but they are two variations on the same thing. And they are two ways of testing for more generalized forms of heteroscedasticity than that which we tested for in the Goldfeld quant test. In the next video, we're going to talk about an even more general test for heteroscedasticity, which is called the white test. I'll see you then.